Praise be Jesus and Mary. Amen. For today's reflection, we're going to continue our series of talks on God's attributes, speaking of the attribute of beauty. God is beauty itself. In philosophy, beauty is often listed as one of what are called the transcendentals. The three other transcendentals are unity, truth, and goodness. Transcendentals are fundamental properties of being, so every being has them. They're called transcendentals because they literally transcend or they go beyond the ten categories of Aristotle. In his work, The Organon, the Greek philosopher Aristotle placed every object that we as humans can comprehend. He placed everyone in one of ten categories. What things didn't fit into Aristotle's categories? Well, they were the transcendentals, unity, truth, and goodness. And later, philosophers added beauty to that list as well. The transcendentals apply to both God and to creatures, so every being is one, true, good, and beautiful. Every being is one because there's an inherent unity to it, so like a tree or a body of water or a person has a unity, has a oneness to it. Every being is true because it corresponds to the idea that God has about it. So, for example, this chapel corresponds to the idea that God has of it. The Milky Way the galaxy corresponds, it's true, to the idea that God has of it as well. Every being is good because existence is a good thing. It's better than non-existence. And scripture says that everything that God created was good. We see that in Genesis chapter 1. And lastly, every being has an inherent beauty to it. The Greek philosopher Plato said that whatever is good is beautiful, said Plato. I was asking myself, well, how is a cockroach beautiful? So that came to mind when I thought of that. And the only thing I could think of was, uh, well, the cockroach's mother certainly thinks it's beautiful, right? That so take that for what it's worth. I'm not sure what it's worth. Dionysius says that God is beautiful by essence and every creature is beautiful by participation. So the beauty in creation actually participates in a very, very small way in the beauty that is God himself. The New Testament word used most often for beauty in, is the adjective Kalos, which can mean either beautiful or good, as Plato referred to. When a woman anointed our Lord at Bethany and his disciples scoffed at what she had done, remember Jesus said to them, why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. Kalos is the word that's used there in Matthew 26, verse 10. So how would we define beauty? Well, beauty is the intrinsic perfection of a thing that manifests itself on the outside and which, when it's clearly perceived, it actually causes delight or spiritual enjoyment. So, like the other transcendentals, the beautiful is the representation in sensible form of actually a spiritual idea. So there's a spiritual reality which is expressed in what we can perceive with our external senses. If I'm not mistaken, it was Plato who gave the example of a flower. He said the reason the flower is beautiful is not just because of the physical parts that make it up, like its color or its shape or its form, because those physical, sensible aspects of a flower, what do they do? Eventually they wither and die away, right? But the idea of beauty itself doesn't wither, doesn't die away with the flower. Even when the flower is gone, the idea and the remembrance of its beauty remains. So the idea of beauty remains because beauty is, again, above all, it's a spiritual reality. And spiritual realities don't corrupt or disappear. When we think of the example of Mother Teresa, which most of us know, most of us, um, I'd say most of us here and many of other people in the world would say that Mother Teresa was a beautiful person, but you'd never find her on the cover of Vanity Fair or any other glamour magazine. Well, why is that? Because her beauty went beyond her physical appearance. Actually, uh, her beauty had essentially nothing to do with her physical appearance, except for perhaps maybe her characteristic smile that she had. Mother Teresa's beauty was spiritual. And actually, I think one of her favorite words was beautiful as well. She would say, let's do something beautiful 
for God. She would say that very often. Also, things like virtues are beautiful. The soul that's in a state of grace is unbelievably beautiful. The angels are indescribably beautiful, but all those realities are above our sense experience. They're beyond what we can see, taste, touch, hear, or smell. So beauty is more a spiritual reality than it is a physical one. St. Thomas said that the beautiful is that which calms the desire by being seen and known. And St. Augustine says this, he said, I ask myself if things are beautiful because they're pleasing or if they're pleasing because they're beautiful. And I respond without a doubt that they're pleasing because they're beautiful. And if one were to hesitate in their response, I would add that things are beautiful perhaps because their parts are similar amongst themselves and are brought to a harmony by means of some reciprocal connections, says St. Augustine. So for something to be beautiful, it has to have a unity with variation among the parts that make it up. So there need to be various realities or perfections that are different amongst themselves, but that when they're joined together, they're, harmon they're harmonious and they're united and they're well-ordered. When I read that, I, the thought came to me of, well, an orchestra or a chorus, right, or a choir, things that are beautiful. You know, in an orchestra or in a choir, what do you have? You have a unity with a variation of instruments and voices and talents all joined together in a well-ordered, harmonious way. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Blessed John Duns Scotus, talking about the pleasing aspect of beauty, says that Delight or pleasure comes from uniting two things that are suitable to each other, said blessed John Duns Scotus. So when God created Adam and Eve, there was actually a beauty in their relationship because they were two persons who became one, and as man and woman, they were suitable for each other. It's also, if you think about it from that perspective, there's also a tremendous beauty in Our Lady too, for example, because God perfectly united himself to her through the Holy Spirit as well. God himself is supremely beautiful. He's the infinitely perfect being that contains within himself in the highest degree all perfections which are in some way distinct, but at the same time harmoniously united, so much so that all of God's perfections are really the same thing in God. That's how beautiful he is. All of his perfections are really the same thing. God reveals his perfections ad extra, meaning outside of himself, already in this world, in all the things which we call beautiful. And even the psalmist says that. He says, the heavens proclaim the glory of God, Psalm 19, verse 1. To use a scholastic terminology, God is the efficient, exemplar, and final cause of every created beauty, as well as being the creator of the essence, oneness, truth, and goodness of all creatures. God's beauty and his perfections are mainly perceivable and visible where? Where can we see God's beauty and perfections in the, in the, in the clearest way? Believe it or not, it's not down here. They're mainly perceived and experienced in the heavenly city, in the New Jerusalem, which, as the apostle says, quote, has no need of light from the sun or from the moon because the light of God illuminates it and its lamp is the lamb, says the apostle in Revelation 21, 23. And the psalmist says in Psalm 50, verse 2, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth, referring again to the heavenly city. So where do we see the perfection of beauty? We'll see it on the other end not in this life. Splendor or beauty and power go before the Lord, says the psalmist, Psalm 96, verse 6. And David says in Psalm 27, verse 4, he says, One thing I ask of the Lord, this alone I seek, to dwell in the house of the Lord all my days, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple, says the king. So how do we apply this attribute of God's beauty to our own spiritual lives? Well, one thing that might be helpful for us to do, for example, is if we see a beautiful person, we should say to ourselves, you know, if that person is so beautiful, imagine how much more beautiful God himself is. 
since he created them. Imagine how much more beautiful the Lord is. So someone or something that is beautiful can be an occasion or an opportunity for us to raise our minds and our hearts to the beauty of the Lord, to the beauty of their creator. And our main focus spiritually should become, should be on becoming more beautifully interiorly, more beautifully spiritually. More important, as we like to say, more important than finding the right person in life, even more important than that, is actually being the right person. And we become the right person when we focus on being beautiful in God's eyes, first and foremost. We are beautiful in God's eyes if we live in God's grace, if we're free of mortal sin, and if we're making a real effort to reflect the character of Jesus and Mary. Exterior beauty, as we all know, it's nice and pleasing, but it's easily deceiving, and it doesn't last forever in this life. Someone can be very beautiful on the outside, but not very beautiful on the inside. And at the last judgment, everyone's going to see what we look like on the inside, right? So if you want uh, some advice, if you're really worried about your appearance, worry about how you're going to appear on that day. So on that day, everyone's going to see you. Everyone's going to see you. So if you want to be uh, prepared, uh, prepare for that day. Everyone's going to have their eyes on you on Judgment Day. So get ready for that day by living in the grace of God now and by becoming more like Jesus and Mary each and every day. So may Our Lady, the beauty of God's creation, may she help us to become more beautiful spiritually so that we will be beautiful both spiritually and physically for all eternity. Praise be Jesus and Mary.